Just beware. You're in for a grossly inaccurate representation of the source materials. <laughs> Salutations Cinemasochists, I'm Marcus Samuel 101 and welcome back to Animonth. This month we are looking at anything and everything related to the wonderful art form that is anime. Last time we had a look at the... <laughs> eh, mo won't miss my words, dog shit adaptation of the anime Bakugana. This time... Death Note. Ah, Death Note. The manga and anime based on the moral quandary by the application of death penalty to worst criminals around the world. Written and set in a country where capital punishment is still practiced. Kinda mixing the message there, aren't you? In all seriousness, it's a really good supernatural crime thriller kind of thing with every minute detail coming into play right up until the end. And then it kind of limped on for another 12 episodes after it SHOULD HAVE FINISHED BECAUSE FUCK IT! But this time we're not going to be reviewing the 25 episode anime. Or the 37 episode anime it ended up actually fucking being! No! We are reviewing the 2017 Netflix movie, Death Note. Boy howdy, a live action adaptation of an anime is already a minefield in and of itself, but then you make it a live action Western adaptation and uh, that's not a minefield, that's just a mine. Like, taping a set towards it is just going to result in an explosion. No avoiding it, it's going to happen. So, the 2017 movie Death Note. I'm just going to come out and say it right now, if you were expecting a flawless, perfect adaptation of the anime, the manga, any of the light novels, you're going to be disappointed. This movie is not for you, and I'm speaking as a fan of the manga, anime, and the light novels especially, it is not the movie for you. Trust me, it's a bad adaptation. This is, if you were to look at it as a pure adaptation of the Death Note story, characters and lore, a bastardized western fuckpit. There's no denying it, no defending it, it's just not going to be your Death Note movie. If you are to look at this as a translation of the Death Note story, however, it actually opens itself up to be a kind of fun movie. It's not the super complicated thriller of the anime where huge deductions hinge on microscopic pieces of evidence and tells. In all honesty, I think there's only an investigation in this movie because the anime was bent around the investigation into the serial killer Kira. Really, the Death Note movie is essentially a dark romance. Which, if you think about it as a fan of the anime or the manga, is kinda weird because the romance between Light and Misa was kind of a secondary element and never really taken that seriously by certain someone, but um, if that turns you off to this movie, I completely understand. But essentially, that's what this film is. It's a dark, twisted kind of romance between Light and Mia, the movie stand-in for Misa. The Death Note is simply the instigating factor in this relationship. And comparisons between the manga and the anime and the movie are going to be fucking unavoidable in this review, so I'll get to those as and when they're needed. But for now, just be safe in the knowledge that this is actually a good movie around the concepts of Death Note. The actors they got to play the characters do a great job. Light's pretty good, Mir is prime sociopath, L, despite a few issues with characterization, is fucking amazing, and the supporting cast all do a great job. But if one person steals the fucking show, it is, as always, Willem fucking Defoe. Okay, I don't often say this about actors, but fucking Christ, Willem Dafoe was born to play Ryuk. I mean everything, everything about this performance from the intonation, the voice, the expressions, everything about Dafoe gives the character of Ryuk life in a way not even his anime counterpart can compete with. I love the way they handle Ryuk as well. The way he's often out of focus and all you can see of him is just those glowing red eyes of the Shinigami. 
His introduction, by the way, is also fucking hilarious because it's like something out of a Goosebumps episode. Something about the music in the scene is just so cheesy 90s that it can't not be compared to Goosebumps. I mean, the rest of the music in the movie is okay, I guess. No real section of the score really stands out as really impressive, but it's good when used to amplify the emotions of the scene. And stylistically, when this movie wants to go full anime with the colour palette, it takes every chance it gets. Like, there's not many opportunities you can go full anime with a dark romance thriller like this, so when it does go hog wild with neon colours and shit, it's really appreciated. So, with all this in mind, let's have a look at the 2017 movie, Death Note. The movie begins with a pretty fair creation of the first few shots of the anime, all things considered. We see the world that we're in, and of course, it's our world, so it's shitty. We're then introduced to our main character, Light Turner whose intelligence is given to us via visual exposition as he's doing homeworks for other students, but in the same take we're shown it's not because he's being bullied, but because he's being paid to do it, so that's fair. I think it's important in the scene to shut up that Light is A, intelligent, and B, not being bullied, because it's an important distinction to make, because if he had been bullied in order to do this homework, that could have turned this movie into a Revenge of the Nerd plot real fucking fast. And of course, just like in the anime, a mysterious notebook falls on the sky and lands at Light's feet, practically. The Death Note. Before he can do much, everyone starts heading inside because it started pissing it down. As he's heading inside, Light tries to break up a fight between an actually bullied nerd and a typical jock who picks on him. And he then gets knocked the fuck out and the teachers find him with all the test papers he was doing. Guess who gets punished? Some people might look at you, a kid in your situation, and they'd be willing to cut you a little slack when it comes to these kind of behavioral issues. Well, I don't believe in that. Detention. Two weeks. Get out of here. This scene does a little to set up exactly why Light does what he does later on. It sets up exactly the sort of path Light ends up taking. He's being punished for a much lesser crime than that of being physically assaulted. The guy who puts him in a position where he needs an ice pack on his face and who caused trouble for two other students is getting away with it, and Light is being punished for doing the homework for other students. There's another scene later on in the film that explains in a bit more blatant exposition why Light does what he does, but for now, we need to focus on the first death caused by the Death Note, because, oh boy! I don't think that in all of the original anime or manga, there was ever a decapitation shown on the screen. Traffic accidents, heart attacks, suicide, yes, but a decapitation? Wow, that's... That's pretty fucking hardcore, especially for the first death caused by this thing. This is also the first scene where Light comes into contact with Ryuk, and, um... Spoiler alert! Anime Light handles this better. <laughs> I told you it went on like that for 10 minutes, would you believe me? Upon getting home, we get that exposition dump I was talking about earlier. Light's mother was killed in a hit and run, the jury got paid off by the guy's rich dad, and Light kind of resented his father because the justice system totally failed to get the man who ruined both of their lives put behind bars. Again, setting up why Light takes the path he does later. The traditional justice system failed to do justice in Light's eyes. And so at this point, I feel like it's important to go for the comparison between movie light and anime light. Light Yagami, the anime version of the character, is a genius. There's no denying it. He's top ranked across Japan levels of intelligence. He has a comfortable life at home, a family who loves him, a father he respects and who's instilled him a strong sense of justice. And he's pretty popular with his friends at school and with the ladies. He's also a complete and utter fucking sociopath. His initial reasoning for wanting to test the Death Note and then later to use it on a crusade to kill all criminals is, yes, I am paraphrasing, but the sentiment is, I did it because I was bored. This is why Light is such an interesting and compelling main character to follow in the anime, because it's such a strange take to go with a main character. In any other situation, Light would be an anti-hero at best, or just straight up the villain. Like Turner, the movie counterpart, is a more relatable version. Closer to being a real person with a real level of intelligence that we can wrap our heads around and with real sort of personalities. 
He's an angsty, slightly edgy teenager who lives in a broken home with a dad who he feels has failed them both, and who constantly reminds him of how fucking broken the justice system is. One thing both of these guys have in common, however, is their fucking godlike egos. I'm not even kidding. They barely have this notebook for, what, a week between the two of them, and they're already fucking calling themselves god. The next day, Light bumps into Mia, and because she asks, he shows her the Death Note and what it can do. The two of them apparently get off on the idea of killing criminals. No, seriously. There's a montage of them fucking, almost overlaid with their plans to kill all criminals. And they team up to form the godlike figure, Kira. The mass murder of known criminals worldwide, however, does not go unnoticed by the world's greatest detective, L. Now, here would be the point where I would go into comparison between anime and film versions of L. That being said, this is actually pretty fucking accurate. L is portrayed just as bizarrely as his anime counterpart. He moves weirdly, dresses in casual clothes, handles everything he touches with a gentleness that borders on reluctance, and isn't afraid to perform questionably unethical actions to achieve the greater result. He sits in the famous L squat and binge eats sweets and candies like it's all he fucking eats. I think they strip back his paranoia a bit, as he's often seen in public, but that's a concession I'm willing to go with. It's in his relationship with Watari that the differences between anime L and movie L shine through. I think a familial connection can be inferred from both versions. Anime Watari, however, acts mainly as an assistant to L and a go-between for him and the police. In the movie, Watari acts as a combination handler and carer, and almost acts as a source of L's mental stability. All that in mind, however, can we just fucking applaud Lakeith Stanfield for fucking portraying the world's greatest detective that fucking accurately? Good job, man. As the legend of Kira grows throughout the world, L contacts Light's father, James, and informs him of his findings regarding the location of Kira. Deducing that Kira must be from Seattle and a member of or connected to the Seattle police, he sets up a group of FBI agents to hunt and follow potential Kira suspects, which includes Light and this causes Light to decide for him and Mia to lay low for a while. Why exactly? I mean, Light doesn't have any reasons not to. The FBI aren't going to follow him into his house, they haven't set up any cameras in his home, and even if they did, he can take the notebook over to Mia's place and they can kill criminals there. They can even set up deaths weeks in advance, so if they wanted to take a little break, there's no reason to go underground at this point. If anything, this action is directly opposed to what Light and Mia should have done. The fact that Kira has stopped killing criminals in this fashion immediately suggests that they are aware of being investigated and confirms L's suspicions. This is literally the worst thing they could have done. I mean, I know, in the anime, L was made aware that Light was one of the first people under investigation as Kira, but that was because he began experimenting with ways on how to get rid of the FBI agents in a week. It was a small move, but L realised the ramifications of it. Here, the fact they all stopped when they noticed they were being followed wasn't a small tell, but a giant fucking red flag. Light even has more options on how to deal with this threat than he did in the anime. And I know what they're doing. They're going through similar plot points and plot beats from the anime to, you know, have a sort of similar plot thread. Something that, for the anime fans to recognise. But if you're going to pick plot points from the anime, guys, Fucking pick the ones that make sense. Anyway, the following week, or days, or whatever, not entirely sure, there's not that many time markers here, the FBI investigation mysteriously all commits suicide, which Light immediately assumes was Ryuk's doing. Despite the fact that Ryuk is literally there to watch the facilitator deaths in the death note, and the fact that Mia has been the one telling Light for the past couple of days that they have to eliminate the FBI investigation. And this brings me to comparing Misa with Mia. Misa Amani is the gothic Lolita model who ends up with the second Death Note in the anime. She's a devout follower of Kira, becomes the second Kira with her own killing sprees, and is the Harley Quinn to Light's Mr. J, complete with uh, relationship dysfunctionalities. She worships Kira and loves Light. Important distinction to make. Mia's son, however, is a lesser love-struck puppy and more a complete psychopath. She loves Light, sure, but she is in love with being Kira. And this little comparison brings me to another point I wanted to applaud the movie for, because knowingly or not, the makers of this movie tapped into another element of the anime and manga. One character divided into two identities. 
In the last 12 episodes of the anime, Kira ends up going against two new detectives, Mello and Nier, the successors to L. Now, I'm not sure if it was intentional on the writer's parts, but these two characters together are L. Mello being L's intense emotion, his drive and potential instability, and Nier being L's logic, his reservedness, his questionable morality and a detachment from humanity. Mello likes candy, Nier likes puzzles, they are both two different sides of L. Now I bring this up because the movie applies the exact same formula to Kira, splitting him up between Light and Mir, and it's pretty fucking good to see Light go at war with himself, so to speak. Light is the purity of Kira's initial goal. He's the desire to do good, to give hope back to the world, to punish the wicked. Mir is the corruption of those ideals. She's a desire for godhood, the ego of Kira, Kira's survival instinct, doing whatever she can to come out on top. I mean... <laughs> It might not be for everyone, but it does multiple things. It sets up a conflict in the relationship, creates a protagonist that we are less conflicted about following, and also does all of this in an idea that feels very death note. The result of the FBI agent's deaths leads to Light's father, James, making his own public announcement about Kira, which, as you might expect, causes friction between the two Kiras. Of course, Light doesn't kill his father, which implicates him as Kira, leading to Light and L meeting face to face. While nothing can ever quite come close to the moment where L reveals himself to Light in the anime, because that is storytelling gold, I feel like this scene is a cute little nod to when Light and L had a coffee after their first tennis match. For everyone who didn't watch the anime, yes, that happened. L ends up revealing his face to Light, confident that Light would be unable to find out his true name. Light, however, decides to go for a workaround by using the Death Note to force Watari into revealing L's true name, with the intent of burning Watari's page from the Death Note afterwards before he dies to save him. This plan doesn't really sit well with me, sir, or L, it seems, who ends up going off the deep end when he discovers Watari has gone missing. And when I say he goes off the deep end... Well, let's just say that Anime L has a tendency to handle these things better. As the clock approaches Watari's time to die, Mia and Light attend the school dance, whilst Watari explores the orphanage that L was raised at. And just as he finds out the information is about to give it to Light... Yes. It's here. What does it say that it is? L's true name. What does it say that it is? What is L's real name? Sir, answer me! Are you Watari? I am Watari. Watari? Said dealer's choice. <laughs> yeah, well, just shit out of luck there, won't you, Light? It's then revealed to Light because apparently the guy smart enough to outplay the world's greatest detective can't figure out his girlfriend went rogue on him. And took it a step further because she actually wrote his name in the Death Note so that he would give up control of the Death Note to her. And you think your relationship has issues? Instead of giving up the notebook, however, Light ends up having to run across the city to avoid being put into protective custody by the police because there is a pissed off L on the warpath. Light and Mia meet up at a ferris wheel where they had a date earlier in the movie, and <laughs> this next exchange proves to me that this is not a thriller, but it is a dark romance. Because guess what? Light put Mia's name in the death note as well. Mia's reaction when she finds this out is just fucking glorious. You put my name in it, didn't you? It was only if you took the book, and I thought I could convince you not to take Are it. Are you kidding me? Like... You put my name in the book, I got mad at him. Take... Are you kidding me? You love me, I thought you wouldn't take the book! And her death ends up being the most dramatic of the movie as she falls from the ferris wheel, pulling out the page of the notebook with Light's name on it, as she does, and crashes into a flower stall. Oh, and Light survives the collapse of the ferris wheel, but the whole debacle ends up disgracing Elle, and the film ends with Light recovering hospital while Ryuk gives one of those classic anime lines. You humans are so interesting. <laughs> and that's Death Note 2017, and honestly, it's not a bad movie. I mean, internally, I don't know what it's trying to do, and there are a couple of holes here and there, but ultimately it doesn't achieve greatness because there is way too much story to be compressed into a single film. It tries to rush through the beats of Death Note to be a faithful adaptation and its own standalone film. Despite 
All that though, it's well written, well acted, and is still a good film that stands apart from the anime and offers a new interpretation of the Death Note mythos. A uh, little boring on repeat viewings, but hey, if the greatest of the manga like it, that's good enough for me. Death Note 2017 is proof to me, concrete proof of that, that live action anime adaptations can be done well. They can be good movies. No, it is not the Death Note movie I knew what I wanted, but for what I did get, I was pleasantly surprised. And that is why Death Note 2017 gets a dark rating of 64. You humans are so interesting. That is my hot take on the 2017 Death Note movie. How many fucking people in the comments are going to be fucking asking for my goddamn head? Ah. Anyway, thank you guys for watching this episode of Darkest One on Reviews. Thank you so much for tuning into Animum. And as always, I've been Darkest Anime 101. You have been watching Darkest 101 Reviews. Thanks for watching. Happy fucking nightmares.